When I was starting out, we weren't facing climate change. We weren't facing loss of diversity. There was a lot of the world that was kind of pristine. And so for me, it was magic. Nobody had studied wild chimpanzees, nobody. So everything was new. That deep intelligence, we might not recognize it, but it's right there in front of us. The idea was to be able to find people that are working on, on the ground, really cutting edge, animal cognition and behavior research, people who might follow in the footsteps of Dr. Jane Goodall. If they keep their eyes, their ears, their minds open, they will discover new things. Capuchin monkeys are extremely intelligent. They are the only neotropical primate that they use tools in the wild habitually. Capuchin monkeys live in South and Central America. So the most common tool that we are going to observe is the stone tools used as a hammer stone to crack open palm nuts. They also use the stones for pounding the soil, and they're going to then dig with their hands, looking for roots, tubers, and trapdoor spiders. They use probes to flush out prey from hiding places. Compared to other animals, it's really sophisticated, especially when they modify the, the probes to have a, a certain size. The aim of the project is to compare two of the populations that have the most diverse toolkit that we know for capuchin monkeys. I think the big question is how this culture evolved in these populations. So it's a socially biased learning, not an imitation. And to try to answer that, I need to, to follow those capuchins for a long period of time. And this research now is going to allow that We don't know yet if they have cumulative culture, if they're going to change something based on previous innovations. That's something that would be interesting to see. One essential thing that we do is this multidisciplinary approach. So I'm working, for example, with archaeologists that are going to analyze the flakes that the monkeys sometimes produce when they're using stone tools, the archaeological record, see for how long they are doing that. We're also going to collect blood samples to do genetic analysis because we want to see if, how different those populations are. The work of Jane Goodall was an inspiration for primatologists in particular, capuchins that were sometimes called the chimpanzee of the new world. <laughs> it's really exciting to, to, to follow her footsteps. <laughs> Honeybees and bumblebees have so many remarkable cognitive abilities. Bumblebees have been used as a model to study cognition for a really long time and it's because they are incredibly good at learning and they're incredibly motivated to partake in the kinds of experiments we do with them. In honeybees and bumblebees, people have shown that they form what are called abstract concepts so they can learn something in a particular context and then apply it to a different context. People have shown basic numerical abilities, basic addition and subtraction, having a concept of zero. I think that animals' cognition or their intelligence is a reflection of the environments that they have evolved in. 
A lot of my work has been around bees learning about pollen. And so I might give them flowers where the blue flowers have got pollen, the yellow flowers don't have any pollen, they discover the pollen on the blue flowers, and then I give them a choice between blue or yellow, and if they go and search for pollen on the blue flowers, then that's an indication that they've learned that association between color and the pollen reward. While we know a lot about bumblebees at the colony stage, we know much less about these queens. And so I found that these queens are really good at learning, and now I want to know why. Are they just kind of giant genius bees, or do they have more specialized cognition in particular ways? And so that's something that I'm hoping to delve into. And then, I'm asking some questions across other native bee species and so trying to understand how ecological variables lead to differences in cognitive traits. One of the big things I take from Jane Goodall is just the power of observation and so through this award we'll be able to spend more time studying bee cognition in the wild. So I chose the cooperation between humans and wild dolphins because it's one of those examples where perhaps that clear boundary between humans and other animals are not so distinct. I believe it started with some clever humans figuring out that if they cannot see the fish in those murky estuarian waters, but they can follow what the dolphins are doing. Dolphins are really good at tracking fish in water, really good at catching them as well. And quickly, the dolphins may have learned they can also take advantage back from the humans, specifically from the tools that humans use to catch the fish, nets. One way is a uh, dolphin go inside the net before it closes, and that can make uh, easier for the dolphin to access the fish. The other advantage they can take from this is when the net hits the water, it typically disrupts the entire uh, mullet school, and some fish can break off from the school, and the fish away from the school is an easier target. So I want to understand first how these two species communicate, coordinate their actions. These interactions, they, they have benefits for both parties and the most, most immediately is the ability to catch fish more efficiently. But if you watch this over time, throughout decades, you also realize that the dolphins, for example, the ones that cooperate with artisanal fishers throughout their lives, they're more likely to survive to adulthood than the dolphins that do not cooperate with them. And the fishers, they also can reap other non-material benefits, such as a sense of cultural identity and a sense of pride from being a fisher who can cooperate with wild dolphins. So there are intangible benefits to it as well. One of the questions we will want to address in this project will be to see whether or not the dolphins communicate among themselves to then coordinate their actions with the humans. So we'll try and do this in this project by having an array of hydrophones, microphones that can record the sound underwater. Having great insights, similar to what Dr. Jane Goodall had, it took time, so we also uh, we feel very privileged to be able to, to study these interactions over the long run. Observation is unbelievably important, and not just the casual observation, but data. Like, I observed the chimps and made notes every 30 seconds. One of the beauties of this is, is that in emulating Jane, we're trying to give people real time on the ground to get the work done. They've got the time to really, really get to grips with whatever subject they are studying. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. I think in this day and age, more than ever, we need to just really 
fully understand and feel that we're part of a bigger system and, and we're not separate from that system. And these three people will really help us do that. Congratulations on being chosen. Never forget that each one of you and all of us on the planet, every day we make some impact and most of us can choose what sort of impact we make.